welcome to another special session with a special Nigerian, somebody we all know very well. Uh, I'm talking of um, Omoyele Shure, the former presidential uh, candidate in the last elections. Um, he's somebody who um, went into the race despite all the challenges put before him and I mean he gave a good account of himself. Uh, of course, he's um, he's um, joining us this afternoon to talk about life uh, and how what to him um, over the last few months. So we're being joined by um, my brother, my friend, um, Omoyele Shule. Thank you, my brother. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yes. So yes, how are you? Uh, good afternoon to. Good afternoon. So everyone, yes, good afternoon. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. I'm here in Abuja. And, okay. Um, just, what have uh, we been doing in the last three months? What have we been up to in the last uh, three, four months, the lockdown? I have been in a second brand of uh, lockdown. Before, last four months, I was locked down at the DSS headquarters in Abuja. Ah. So. And uh, after that, when I was released, finally, the the judge put me in another lockdown to stay in Abuja uh, until the until such a time that we can discharge the bail conditions, the onerous bail conditions imposed upon me for fighting for my rights. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the pandemic came. Or do you want to call it this pandemic? Uh, came and. Uh, we have been here since then, uh, dealing with all kinds of issues, yes. So how do you cope with all of these challenges? What do you make of all these challenges uh, before you? I don't. I see them as part of uh, what goes on with um, the territory of our work. I, uh, you worked in a pretty hard place before now. I think you worked with one of Nigeria's uh, most difficult magazines in the past. Yes. Yes. And you know what it means for you to be seen as an enemy of the state because you are in the business of telling the truth. Uh, so my own situation, not compounded, but uh, speaks to all of it together. You know, I've been a publisher of a newspaper or a news, um, an online web news that's very critical of government. I suppose it's corruption and puts all these people on their toes and put their feet to fire. And then I decided to challenge them in 2018 uh, bring a new brand of politics into the Nigerian political context. Campaigned across the country, spoke my mind, and uh, really connected with uh, people. And they weren't happy about that at all. So they threw all kinds of uh, challenges at me, curveballs, got me arrested, detained, uh, abducted me in court, tortured, tried to dehumanize me, and tried to break my spirit. But like I said, all these things come with the territory of the work we do as uh, activists, as writers, as uh, public conscience. So, and revolutionaries who want to see a different country that is different from what we have now. So, and uh, we've, I'm very clear, I would never accept anything less than what we have now, no matter what it takes. Mm -hmm. This country could be a fantastic country. We could be living in a country that's one of the best in the world, if not the world, best in Africa. Uh, we should be one of the six best countries in the world, going by the kind of revenue we've made in the last uh, 60 years. Because we are the top six oil-producing uh, countries in the world. But uh, our situation has uh, spoken to a different kind of uh, condition, which is pathetic. And people like me uh, have been doing this for a long time. Uh, as you know, as a student activist, pro-democracy activist, human rights activists, environmental activists. We had to do pretty much everything so that we can have a country that we can call our own. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. But we will get there, whether they like it or not, because the current conditions, the current situation of our country is not sustainable. It doesn't, mm -hmm. matter, it doesn't matter the amount of force, intimidation, harassment, detention they put into it. Uh, someday, the Nigerian people will be tired of uh, the burden of uh, irresponsible and irresponsive incompetent leadership, and they will throw it off their backs. So you think the Nigerian problem is squarely leadership in nature? Oh, absolutely. I was, um, I happen to be very close to 
I was close to Shino Achebe before he passed through his family. And I listened to him speak about Nigeria, uh, Nigeria's problem. Just because those ones even have a different kind of experience, better experience than we did. They went through a civil war. You know, yeah. they were in Nigeria, they left Nigeria, came back. <laughs> And they came to the conclusion, having tasted both, both wars, that leadership makes a lot of difference in whatever you think about. And it's, it's just, if you don't have leaders, you don't have a country. Mm. That's mm. as simple as that. You know, and there's a difference between what you call a country, which is uh, literary, and there's what they call a nation, mm. which is substance. Well, we have a country because we are listed on... Uh, the names of countries in the world, but yeah. we don't have a nation, uh, mm. which is a place where people can be served their real dignity as human beings. Mm. And this is as a result of the kind of leaders we've had uh, successively in uh, the country known and named Nigeria. Mm. So that, that, that's, a, that's really deep for me. We have a country, but no nation. Yes. Mm. And then, nations are and, deeper than countries. The, the countries are yeah. just geographical expressions. Hmm. Nations are spaces of culture, integrity, dignity, and uh, respect. A place where you can uh, have happiness. A place where you have conditions that are suitable for human living. That's why they call them nation states. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. But a country, if you look at the meaning of a country, it's just a, a designated place with a boundary. <laughs> so uh, Nigeria, unfortunately, did not become a nation because it was designed as a business by the British. And we never transcended what the British did to us to transcend into a nation. A lot of countries that were created by the British became a nation because at a point, their people came together and redesigned, you know, uh, their own ideas of what a nation should be and how they want to live. But in our own case, the moment they were done uh, with creating Nigeria as a country, they handed us over to some of the most terrible managers. Because Nigeria was designed by a guy named Goldie, uh, who went to the Niger Delta region and was doing uh, palm oil business. Uh, they were selling uh, produce. And when they got there, found out that uh, in the place known as Akasa today, that people were already doing the business. They killed all the people there, including King Jaja Bopobo, who was uh, captured and exiled. Because they saw Nigeria as a country. In fact, Lord Lugat, who created Nigeria, had been a mercenary who was in a place called Buganda, now known as Uganda and Kenya, and Tanzania, part of Tanzania. And they brought him from there. And when he was coming, I uh, met a journalist who is known as Flora who named the nation of Nigeria, Nigeria area. Some people have said it's Niger area, but, you know, it was named after River Niger. So all of everything else that happened after that was a history that we have no idea about. Even the person who they claim discovered uh, River Niger never made it to the end of the River Niger. So everything is a lie, but <laughs> it's really told here, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it's what is, that's, so everything was wrong at the beginning and from the beginning. But part of the reason I don't keep saying that, oh, because we're created by the British, we can. There are a lot of countries that were also created by the British or inhabited by the British who have gone past that. We can't keep giving the excuses that um, because the British created Nigeria. The British created India too, right? Uh, and, you know, India used, Pakistan used to be part of India, I think, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, but at the point when they saw they couldn't get together, some of them separated, but India is still functioning. Even America was initially occupied by the Brits, the USA, until they dropped them out and created their own country. Uh, so, I mean, created their own nation. At that point, it was a country. But even the Americans met, uh, you know, they met a the nation there. They dismantled it, the American Indians, and, you know, created oh. their own nation from it. And when you create a nation, you have a set of laws. You have ideal, the ideas and ideals. And then, but most importantly, you put leaders that sustains the dreams, aspirations of that new nation. And those are the things. When you talk about America today, talk about their founding fathers. Nigeria, when we talk about our founding fathers, it seems like a joke. You're wondering, well, founding, who founded this rubbish? 
that it's the, well, how do we end up with a country like this and we're talking about founding fathers you know um and i'm not in any way denigrating people who went to negotiate for independence for us but this doesn't look like a country that was well founded if it was well founded it was founded on a very terrible uh foundation and it has to do um, with the, the poor men and the supervisors who build the nation <laughs> and the architects. Mm. That's why mm. you can blame the British. The but you can of your you just not forget the poor men and the, What and went to your mind all through that period that you were detained? Nothing. I, because I had been incarcerated before uh, several times, but not as long as this. I was a student activist, as you know. So we were like the rest of... Uh, our senior colleagues like Gani Fawemi, Femi Falano, Agbakova, Shegum Ayegun, we were all part of that period in the 1990s, uh, especially during June 12. So we went to, we've been to, uh, we've been to jail before, police detention here and there, DSS, but nothing as long as. So when I was there, I was um, practically in um, solitary detention for most of the time. You know, it's, uh, it's tough. I, even psychologists will say that um, it's only allowed for the period allowed for someone to be in solitary detention and be normal is 24 hours. Mm. So, but I spent uh, some three to four months. Then Bakari Olawale was made to join me towards the end of our uh, detention in my detention area. So it was in that regard. The idea was to make sure that I don't have access to information. They break me and they make me feel miserable. But you see, if you find yourself in detention, you have to decide not to jail yourself. If you are not jailing yourself, then you're fine. But if you agree to jail yourself and they're jailing you, uh, it makes it very tough uh, to survive. How do you mean? Any kind. What's the difference? What's the difference? What's the difference? The difference the is, uh, is, you know, it's, it's mental composure. It's how you feel mentally, okay. how you respond to your condition. The, the other side of it is that you are afraid, you are panicky, and uh, they will they watch you. When you are in detention, they watch you. They watch, they watch what you are reacting to. They watch how you sleep, how you wake up. They know all of that so that they can know how to apply pressure points on you. Hmm. Uh, and physically, for people like us who are, you know, um, who are internet buffs, who, whose life depends on the digital uh, technology, I mean, it would depend on t digital technology. They know it's harder for someone to be detained these days without access to news, a cell phone, you know, uh, an internet, and then no television, no radio in 2020 for doing nothing. So there are times that I will feel like my phone is ringing and I'll look for it only to find out that uh, I'm in detention and my phones have been taken away because this is how mm. I've lived my life maybe in the last 20 years or so. So that part is tough. They understand that. And they use whatever they can. They maximize the pressure points to see how fast they can break you or ensure that you don't talk to your family. I was only allowed to talk to my wife maybe three times in five months. And they are, they are monitoring every conversation you have so, uh, so that they can pick up whatever they can to use against you. And then... On top of that, they go looking into your accounts, uh, breaking into your phones uh, to see what they can find that they can use against you. Because that's the deal. The deal is they knew that I didn't commit any crime. No. But the deal is to see what they can use to give the public a different impression about my person, my personality, mm -hmm. because I've been such a difficult person for them. They were telling me, how is it that you are in this country and you, you are not approachable? You don't come to us. We can't reach you. We can't bribe you. You can't talk to you. You know, they don't like that because they are used to people who are malleable. They are used to people who they can manipulate, who they can oppress and harass. To find out you are one person who doesn't have all of that. And most importantly, to find out that they thought you are corrupt, you know, and they could use that against you. And look at your account. They found 850 naira left in my account. Um, I look at Nigerian account, and that was disappointing to them. And uh, they went to Sahara reporters, discovered that they had to charge me for money laundering for transferring money to myself, according to them. <laughs> so, so it was, it was, it was such a, you know, and then they had to withdraw the charges when we got to court. So they wanted what they were doing as they were detaining me was to find something they can present to the public 
so that the public um, support that they, that we were getting could win. And they, you know, they did it through the media. They, you know, they had a lot of analysts out there. They paid them off to be analyzing against me. You know, all the money shows they had people. They had. They don't have uh, at the DSS a phone bank where they call into radio stations whenever they are discussing your issues and try to really model it up. It's all kinds of uh, what the U.S. and the U.S. is call a counter interpro, you know, to mm. in a counter intelligence unit, just to make the public feel bad about you. And when they couldn't find anything to do about that, they then started looking for a way to let me off. But they couldn't do that uh, without thinking that there would be a blowback against them. So that was why they went to court. And when they went to court the first time I released it and discovered that I was not broken, they had to abduct me again. Um, and when that happened and they got more uh, pushback, they eventually had to let go, grudgingly. Uh, but they still did not withdraw the charges. They reduced the charges from seven counts to now two counts. They moved the money laundry, ridiculous money <laughs> laundering charges because it was a disgrace to them. Uh, and then they kept... Uh, and then the, the idea that I was insulting Buhari, because our lawyer has made a great uh, point. Femi Fala, you have to give it to him. He said that uh, the cybercrime law says that the person that is uh, directly affected by the crime must testify. So we, we, we said to the judge that we would like, uh, like to bring Buhari to court. To come and explain how the internet, considering the fact that the man claims that he has a yeah, infection. How did he hear it? Does he read the internet? <laughs> Does he have a bank account? Does he have it? So when they saw that uh, Femi Father had laid out in the court, they withdrew all the charges of uh, uh, cyber crime as well. So we're only left with treasonable felony. Uh, this bogus idea that I'm planning to overthrow the government uh, because uh, I called for a protest uh, August 5 last year. Very interesting. Yes. So how 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 is yes, how how talking about um, Sarah reporters now? Are you still actively involved in the um, running of your your organization, or you've handed it over to a management to run? It's it, since I started running for office, I handed it okay. over. I resigned active from active uh, control of Sarah reporters, and uh, they are aware okay. of that. They also investigated that and found out that it's being run by. So I reporters was running even when I was in detention. And part of the reason they put me in, um, in limbo or in communicado was to prevent me from having control over what is published on Sahara reporters. So effectively, they found out that with or without me, the organization was run. It has become a public trust. You know, it's a citizen reporting platform. So it's run by other people. And they, are, they did a good job of running, and they are still doing a good job of running it. You know? But I'm a founder. So, I report that. so uh, just like uh, you have your own platform too, there's a, it's something they call founder syndrome uh, and thing in psychology, where you find something yeah. that is dear to you, of course, you will always tend to find out what's going on with it, how it is going on, because it's your dream. It's, uh, it's something that you created from innovatively from your mind, and uh, you always mm. wanted to to work. Not only Sahara Reporters, I want every journalism platform that is doing the right job to prosper and function very well. I'm a, I'm a stickler for free speech, free press. So I was, uh, in fact, when, I would, when they gave me a phone one day to speak with my family, I didn't call my family at first. I called Premium Times and spoke to them. Uh, and when they saw that Premium Times was, I'd been spoken to, because they were monitoring the phone, they ran to me and said, you have to give us back our phone. I said, no, I, I have to call my wife. And I called my wife, I called the lawyer, and then gave them back their phone. So because I want all these platforms to work, because we don't have, we don't even have enough press in Nigeria. There are 200 million people here, maybe only 10 major newspapers, a lot of blogs, you know. Uh, but you go to the U.S., which has 220 million people, you probably have like a million media platforms. TV oh. stations, every village has its own TV station, township, newspapers. We don't, we are not there, we haven't gotten anywhere yet in terms of the saturation of media because media is uh, the fourth estate of the realm, right? Uh, yeah. 
But if we are not careful, the media can also become the fifth columnist from the from the rear. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But right now, the, the media is going through a lot right now in terms of challenges and all that. It is. Do... It's, it's always been like that. It's always been like, you see, look, the media job is a thankless job. You know, uh, and you know what it is. People, everybody wants to control what goes out in the media, particularly governments. And in hmm. Nigeria, unfortunately for us, government is still competing with the private sector in terms of media. There is a fair disadvantage. One, they still have their own media platforms, which they shouldn't be allowed to have. There shouldn't be an NTA in this country anymore. And then they have organizations that are controlling the private media space. They try to control the private. When they can't control it directly, they go and introduce bill, hate speech bill, social media bill, all of it is targeted at the media because they don't want a media that scrutinizes government. That is why we, we have all this problem. The media is not doing enough in terms of fighting for the media space. And all of us, you guys are guilty of this, you know. Nigeria, for example, still has like terrible libel laws you know, a governor can sue you in their state with the chief judge that is appointed by him and win a libel lawsuit against you. Mm. You know, it shouldn't be like that, right? We still have that British type of libel law in Nigeria. You know, even when you are right in a libel lawsuit, even when you are right, nobody pays for your legal fees, you know, and nobody mm. is fighting for these things. So they can harass you. There's a lot of ways they have criminalized even simple reporting. If they can get you, they can come and arrest you and detain you and claim that uh, they are trying you for criminal libel. Criminal libel is, you know, is, is unheard of in modern day uh, journalism. But the journalists are not doing a good job because a lot of our journalists are aspiring to become uh, chief press secretaries, special advisors <laughs> to politicians. Serious journalists don't aspire to become an appendage of the people they are reporting against. Otherwise, Already you have established a conflict of interest in your reporting. Okay. Somebody is asking a question about um, um, did opposition use you to bring in PMB as you have been accused by Reno Omokiri? I don't Listen, understand. Listen, you know, I, people have accused me of all kinds of things. Yeah. But um, when you ask them to go and bring evidence. Evidence. Hmm. Yes. Can you support Buhari without attending his rally? It's without <laughs> getting an advert from him? Advert from without... him, yeah. I can hear you now. Yeah. Yes. Without writing an article, without any meeting. Ronnie Amokri, as I was told, said that he has evidence even from the NIA to show that I was holding meetings with Buhari and the rest of them. Why is it so difficult to put out the evidence? If I have evidence against Reno Mokri, for instance, when Reno Mokri went and stole the identity of somebody known as Gwende Simlin, I met the mother. I interviewed her. I put it out. That's the evidence. And the woman said, yes, uh, Reno Mokri is an identity thief. When Reno Mokri sent soldiers to the mother's house to eject somebody from their house in a worry or so, I got the information, I put it out to Sarah reporters. In fact, it led to him being fired by Jonathan. Because most people did not know that Reno Mockley did not complete his tenure with Jonathan. Jonathan fired him towards the election because of a lot of criminal activities he was engaging in. Reno Mockley claims to be an Amazon uh, bestseller. Can you just find out how many books he's selling? What's the name of the book? So I'm not personalizing it. I'm just telling you that okay. I am an evidence-based person. If he says, oh, look, there's no need to, there's no need engaging in emotional conversations. But, you know, all the political leaders in this country have their own supporters. Even if you look today, there are people who still support Abacha. You know, mm. where Bamangira has his supporters. Jonathan has his supporters. So once in a while, when they miss the past, the terrible past, they organize what I call a, a pity party so that they can pity themselves, you know. The thing that Reno Mockery did not tell you is that he wouldn't have had the job he had with Jonathan, the money he made, whatever he benefited. Had we not fought for Jonathan to become president when Joe Adria was sick, 
So, and I'm glad that he said that I have so much power to put Buhari in power. But why are they not giving me credit for putting Jonathan in power when Yaradwal mm. Kabal prevented him from... In fact, they were planning a coup at that time. We were exposing it every day until Jonathan was allowed to run, I mean, to become the president of Nigeria. When, because we knew Yaradua was not coming back. Go and ask Reno Mokiri if he attended a protest on behalf of Jonathan. Never. We did. I did in America. We organized the People's Parliament. We did write-ups upon write-ups. Just I've never met Jonathan before. I didn't care who he was. In fact, when Jonathan won the election, he sent to Ron to Douglas, late Ron to Douglas, to me that I should come and work for him. I said, I cannot work in government. I can't last 24 hours in the government. I'm too honest, brutally honest. When, after that, he sent Iman Iboro. Iman Iboro is still alive to come to New York and give us token, the money that they said Iman sent. I said, I refuse to see Iman Iboro right I said, I don't need your money. I did this out because of my conscience. Mm. And I hope you guys perform. So what I want to wrap up here is that the person who brought Buhari to power, the number one person, is Jonathan. It was his performance in office that enabled the likes of Buhari to come back to office. Let me tell you, when Buhari ran for office against Jonathan, if a goat had run against Buhari, Jonathan, he would have won. Monkey could have won that election. People were tired. The corruption... Jonathan was one of the luckiest former presidents in the president in this country. He was selling uh, crude oil at one forty dollars per barrel. Money was all over the place. I watch, and I heard that uh, Renan Mokri also listed some stories that he said were true. Some of the stories are actually still actively being prosecuted in Italy, with uh, regards to OPL uh, that OPL two forty five. You know, the wife was found with a lot of money. It's public information. So I don't need to, again, personalize oh. these, these issues. But oh. I can understand that some people feel bad that uh, they've lost out. Renault Mercury himself works for Atiku, right? If you really hate people who took uh, Jonathan out of power, why would you be working for Atiku? Atiku donated money, jets, to Buhari's campaign. And Renwa Mokri is working actively for Atiku to return to power again. So you can see the hypocrisy there. Okay. I was going to say that um, how, do you, how do you always feel when you see um, I mean, the state of um, our situation in Nigeria, uh, especially now, with all the challenges we are faced with? How, how does it make you feel when you wake up each morning and you still see that we still have not been able to do much to get things changed it's very sad and that's why i'm restless the reason why i take all the risk i have taken you know after we all fought and including you against military rule by the end of 1999 when uh, civilian rule was, was calling what we thought was civilian civilian rule what i now call a uh, morontocracy you know it's a government for morons by moron and by morons I left the country. 1999 February, I left Nigeria. And I, sp I stayed out of Nigeria for 20 years. Went to school, got married, had kids. And each time I came back since 2004, actually since 2003, my, it breaks my heart. And it was what led me to set up Sahara Reporter. It was what led me to participate in politics because I know that there's so many things that can be done without... You know, there's a lot of things that are broken in this country that they make it sound like governance is rocket science. It's not. You know, to fix a road that has been budgeted for, it's not rocket science. And for someone who is unarguably, unarguably aware and informed about how things can work, how things can work, right? Of course, it disturbs me. I'm restless. It's the reason I took the risk to come and run for office. It's the reason after I ran for office, I declared that uh, we need a revolution. And mm. I was arrested. And I did not renounce it. Even when they sent a delegation to me in detention, led by Issa Puntua and Garba Shew, to ask me to renounce uh, revolution, I refused. I said, it's not possible. Until mm. we find a country that belongs to all of us. And they said to me, Issa Puntua said specifically, he said, nobody has ever fought a government and won. 
very arrogant uh, old man like that. I told him, well, maybe for the first time you find somebody who can win against the government. I don't know mm. if it's me, but I know this system is not sustainable. Mm. They left me. That was two weeks after I was returned. They left me. Next thing I hear from them, they had uh, charged me for uh, money laundering, cyber stalking, and treason, treasonable felony. Because they were hoping that they can pressurize me to abandon the struggle uh, or scare me. And when they found I wasn't scared, they went to the next level, which is to charge me with bogus offenses. Uh, and that led to, I stayed, after they met with me, I stayed another four months uh, in detention until I was uh, released, granted bail on some of the harshest conditions. The only person in the history of Nigeria who has been restricted to a city was Obafemi Awolowo when he was charged for treason in the 60s. I'm the second yeah. person in the history of Nigeria. He was restricted to Lekki area. Me, I'm restricted to Abuja. It's called city arrest. Mm. <laughs> mm. Um, yes. You spent four, four, a total of four months. Yeah, I, I spent four months in detention. I was, I was arrested uh, on August 3rd, 2019, and I was uh, released on uh, December 24th, 2019. So mm -hmm. you can do the calculation. Yeah. 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 Are you likely to run again in 2023? I'm running from now. I don't wait to 2023. <laughs> I keep telling people, you know, what Nigeria needs is liberation. If you can get it now, why wait to 2023? Hmm. So the race has started, you know, and it's race for human rights, freedom, respect for the dignity of our people, and end to unemployment, respect for social and physical infrastructure. I mean, this, that's the race we are running. We are running the race of not our time, but of our lives. And mm. it's both political and non-political. It's mm. partisan and non-partisan races that we have to run. Because our people have been buried mm. under the ground. We have to take them out. Mm. Thank you very much, my brother. It's been nice having you on our program. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me as well. And uh, nope. have a pleasant weekend. We start uh, okay. from tomorrow. From tomorrow. Thank yes. you. Okay. You take care.